So I'd like to talk about this conceptual framework. Disruptive ideas, startup companies, and open innovation. Sounds like a great collection of things. So a disruptive idea, which is usually called a disruptive innovation. I avoid the term innovation here because innovation is used in two different senses. It's used for the process by which you develop a new product and bring it to market. It's also used for the new thing that you bring to market itself. So in this sense, the new thing is, is somehow disruptive. It creates a new market or a new value network, usually by selling something to a new group of people. But it also eventually disrupts an existing market or value network. Um, it may displace an existing product. It may displace an existing industry. Uh, it can cause a major change in a supply chain. Um, this is, there's a lot of literature on this, but it really goes back to the work of Professor Clayton Christensen at Harvard. So he talked about uh, disruptive innovations. So good disruptive innovation going on right now. Smartphone cameras, right? Interesting thing about smartphone cameras is that although there were all kinds of experiments by Ericsson and in the United States and elsewhere in the 1990s, the first time a mobile carrier offered a phone with a camera in it was J-Phone in the year 2000. That doesn't seem like that long ago. J-Phone is was a Japanese uh, mobile carrier, and they're now, they were bought by Vodafone, the English company, and then they were bought by uh, uh, SoftBank. So they started all of this, and the early phones were pretty low quality compared to the compact cameras, even the point and shoot cameras that you could get on the market. Um, but they had connectivity, they were connected to your telephone, right? And they were really convenient. There was a, there's an old story about what is the best camera? The one that you have with you. So they were convenient. As the smartphone appeared with a standard operating system and also downloadable applications, they got a lot more useful. Can't, smart, uh, cell phone cameras got to be a lot more useful, uh, especially for things like photo sharing. Another economic point is that the cost of the camera is bundled into the cost of the phone. You really don't have a choice of different cameras with an Apple iPhone, right? You get what they put in it. Um, there have been major improvements in the camera functionality itself since those early years, but they were popular from the very beginning. Cell phone cameras were popular from the time they were introduced. But now you can get a cell phone camera with a 41 megapixel image sensor, which is just sort of astounding to me. Um, but the disruptive nature of this innovation is not just how good the technology has gotten. The disruption is really against point and shoot cameras. When I uh, prepared for this, you should see the articles that came out since about last year of how Smart, smartphone cameras are the death knell for, sounding the death knell for point and shoot cameras or compact cameras. Their sales fell by 30% in 2011 and National Geographic and the Consumer uh, Electronics Association pointed out that 37% of all of the images taken in the United States were with camera phones in 2011, and that's expected to rise to 50% by 2015. That's a pretty big disruption of the existing camera industry. Now, it's true that the big, high-end uh, SLR digital cameras are still growing well. They grew about, 40, that market grew about 30% last year. But to quote The Guardian, Canon and Nikon should pay heed or risk sequestering themselves in the ultra high-end camera ghetto. So this is a classic example 
of a disruptive innovation. You've got a creation of a new technology for a new market or a customer base. Then you've got performance improvements in the new device, which often started out at a lower level than existing products. And that is now disrupting or displacing some earlier product and market. Often, this involves new firms taking over an industry or new kinds of industry structures like new supply chains. So, interesting point. Were automobiles a disruptive innovation? And this goes back to work by Christensen. The actual invention of the automobile was not particularly disruptive. It didn't really replace the horse and carriage at first. The car started in what, the 1880s something? Until the Model T Ford was invented in 1920 something or other, um, there really wasn't much disruption of existing transportation industries. But because the Model T was lower price and mass produced, that's when people basically started traveling around in a different way. What did the Model, disrupt, the Model T disrupt? Horse-drawn carriages, okay. Also, city street, you know, street cars used to be all over the place. They dropped like a rock after the introduction of the telephone. Rail transportation in general. Some people argue that the reason rail transportation in the U.S. has gone down is because of the interstate highway system, which is the disruptive innovation, the highways or the cars. Um, it also disrupted most of the early automobile companies. There were dozens of them that failed because Ford took over the market. And so really, yes, it was disruptive in a number of different ways. Um, a couple of other more recent disruptive innovations. First of all, online advertising. I think this is fascinating because online advertising is taking the business away from traditional newspaper ads, magazine ads, TV commercials. There's a clear sucking away of that business. The newspapers are in, are in real trouble, right? But the other thing is this online advertising is at the center of a whole new supply chain. Now, the price of an advertisement on the internet can be optimized Change, meaning changed, right, uh, once every 100 milliseconds. Real-time bidding is a hot new feature of the advertising industry. One of the reasons that this works is you've got people on the demand side who will aggregate all of the requests for advertisements by different companies that want to have their ads up on the internet, and the demand side platforms will guarantee not only that you get to a certain size audience, they will guarantee who you get through to. It's much more personalized than ever before. They want you to get to the influencer who will really encourage other people to buy your product. Um, on the supply side, there are other aggregator companies that basically aggregate all of the publishing space that's available. This is kind of like the old... Uh, advertising agency uh, business, but they're doing it online. And they will then maximize the kind of price that those companies can get uh, through this real-time bidding process. So you have a very new supply chain built up around this thing. Online retailing is really changing the, um, the regular retail businesses, right? Not only is it cutting into sales of the brick and mortar stores, but it's changing the way that all retailers do business. How many regular old stores like Safeway are sending you emails, right? Emails or have loyalty coupons of some sort that you can download on your cell phone or whatever. This is, we're in the middle of a really huge transformation of a number of industries. This past year, in May 2013, McKinsey Global Institute set out a 150-page book of the 12 
disruptive innovations that are going to change the way the world works. And these 12 disruptive innovations are things like 3D printing, genomic technologies, so on and so forth. But they predict that these 12 disruptive innovation areas will be the source of $33 trillion of new value by the year 2025. The total world GDP in 2025 is predicted to be $100 trillion. Right now it's about 50 or 60. So this is, uh, you know, very interesting kind of uh, things to stay involved with. Now, startup companies are a great source of disruptive innovations. All companies have to innovate. If you don't innovate, somebody else eats your lunch pretty quickly. Um, even, you know, things like car companies or retail industries are always coming up with new kinds of sale promotions, new models, slight new, you know, variations on how the store looks. All, all businesses have to innovate. There are two big risks in innovation. The first risk is that you might not be able to deliver what you're trying to develop. That has been called technology risk. That was the term that Christensen used. There's another risk, and that is that even if you develop it, nobody's going to want to buy it. That's the market risk. If you are a big company, you can spend an awful lot of money developing a major new technology for an existing market. And companies do. So Honda Motor, this year is delivering Honda Jet, a small business jet for about six people that has all kinds of new performance characteristics and looks pretty neat. But the business jet market is relatively well known. They were able to predict how many airports they could get this thing into. They uh, were able to justify putting dozens of years of work and hundreds of people onto a project like this. Similarly, if you've got a relatively well-known existing technology, you can spend an awful lot of marketing money developing a new market for it. So what did Apple really do with the iPhone? It's a combina new combination of existing technologies. In fact, even the smartphone already existed before Apple started to develop the iPhone. But they put their brand behind it, they put their resources behind it, and did pretty well with it. If, however, you're creating a new technology and creating a new market, right, or creating a new technology for a new market, typically a big company can't incubate a technology, uh, an, an idea like that for a long time. It's going to start out outside a big company. So look at Tesla Motors. Before Tesla came along with the Roadster, other companies had been playing around with electric cars for existing markets, the around town market. Tesla Motors comes up with the idea of a high performance electric sports car. Okay, that's hard development, but it's also very risky. Who in the world would want one? Why would I want an electric sports car? You know, you, first of all, you have to convince me that it really does outperform a Porsche. And second, I really miss the sound of the gears changing, right? So that is a classic case of a, dis a, a new major innovation that started out in a startup company. Uh, Facebook was that way. Facebook was really, okay, an interesting kind of tweaking of the technologies to make everything work, and also a big question about how in the world you make money with it. For the first few years of Facebook, I really did not understand how they were getting revenue. Um, so in any case, uh, it's not the creation of the invention. In Silicon Valley, so often we focus on the beginning stages of this. 
we focus on entrepreneurship and how important it is to create a new idea. But if you really look at the valley, it's not the creation of the thing that makes it disruptive or high value. It's the pattern of growth. In this uh, book by McKinsey Global Institute, they say that they would define um, disruptive innovations based on the ultimate size of the market, the potential for reaching hundreds of millions or billions of people, the impact of the new technology on multiple industries, the impact on uh, an economy itself, what percentage of an economy is likely to be involved with that new area of technology. They also talked about the transformative effect, that a new technology that really changes the supply chain of an industry or changes the people, the way that people live or work would have a, uh, you know, would be a candidate for a disruptive technology. They took a hundred candidate technology areas and, and selected 12 for this, uh, for this study that they did. Um, so you'll hear us talk about the term value chain this quarter. A value chain is similar to a supply chain in that it's an interlinked set of activities that are necessary to deliver a product to a market. Um, so the classic elements of a supply chain, system design, then you've got component design and component manufacturing, then you've got final assembly, then you've got distribution, finally you've got sales. And none of that means anything for value until somebody buys it. So the point of a value chain is to start with the final purchase and see how the revenue is divided upstream. Who gets the profits out of this? At particular nodes in the supply chain, where are you going to find heavy competition so that the buying firm can negotiate <laughs> narrower profit margins for these suppliers? And where are you really dependent on one or at most two suppliers who can negotiate a better deal with you? That kind of dynamic goes into value chain. Um, there are really two ways to create a new, uh, major new value chain. You can start for nothing, from nothing and create a new industry, or you can transform some existing value chain, including the value chain of another industry. In history of Silicon Valley, we've seen a number of these new industry value chains. In fact, the whole history of the valley looks like a series of big waves where you've got some sort of an innovation, and I call all of these disruptive innovations. You can argue whether it's disruptive of an existing industry or not. Uh, but around some new innovation, a new industry grew, and every industry that grew had some rising star coming out in Silicon Valley that became a world leader in that industry. If you really want to know why Silicon Valley is famous, it's not because 17,000 startup companies are created here every year. It's because there are two or three gigantic, important startup companies that really become world leaders out of each one of these uh, kinds of um, you know, new industry waves. So if you look at some of these superstar companies, you find that at the beginning of sales, it's all over the place. Growth is all over the place. But by the fifth year of sales, they have settled down to about 100% a year growth. If you take this out for another five years, in their first 10 years of sales, these companies averaged around 100% growth each year. That, managing that kind of growth is not really taught in business schools. I'm not sure how teachable it is. Because every case, it's, it's managing chaos. It's crazy. Um, you've got 50 employees this year, and you'll have 250 next year, and you'll have 350 the year after that. And suddenly you're in five markets when last month you were only in one. This kind of growth is 
incredibly explosive. Now, only a few companies ever achieve this kind of result, of course. They do become the model that everybody pays attention to. You know, we're living on the post-Twitter sort of good feeling right now, right? But the economic success of the Valley as a whole is not just from these companies. The North NVCA, North American Venture Capital Association, this past year reported that there were 460 exits of companies. This is where the founders can sell their, uh, the founders and the investors in the company can sell their stock to somebody else. Of those 450 something exits that they considered to be successful, the investors got a good return on their cash, about 90% of them were through acquisitions by a big company. 10% of those were through IPO. Now, in Silicon Valley, every year, about 17,000 companies are created. About 10,000 either die or move away to where it's cheaper. So of these 7,000 companies, you've got you know, a goodly number of companies that are exiting by means of being acquired. So this means that we ought to look at how the big companies play a part in the Silicon Valley system. From the standpoint of a big company, you have to have a pipeline of innovation. You can't live on one innovation forever. You've got to introduce new products and services to market once in a while. Most of the new ideas that you have are never going to see the market. A company will only take the ones to market that have the best prospects for success and that are the best fit to the company's overall strategy. This means that the further away from the market you are, the more you have to really consider a wider range of possibilities. It's fascinating. Companies spend 90% of their R&D budget in development, only about 10% in applied research and basic research. And yet, you have to look at even more possible ideas further out so that you don't get stuck in a corner with your competitors in a place where you want to be. The uh, traditional solution was to have a big company with a big R&D group. So this kind of closed innovation system was why AT&T Bell Labs was so distinctive. IBM Research was very distinctive. But for the last 20 years, uh, companies have figured that this is not sufficient to sustain their pipelines of innovation. They are actively looking for knowledge and ideas from outside the firm and for the ideas that they're not going to use in their own business, they spin it out so that they get some revenue from other people using it. Um, this much is, is pretty well known. This is this open innovation framework. Professor Cheeseborough over at Berkeley is the most famous person in regard to the study of open innovation. Um, but to take it beyond what I had seen in his work, there is a natural division of labor depending on how far away you are from the market. And it's fascinating to see how companies manage open innovation in a way to optimize return and risk. Um, Google, we did a study of Google in 2011. The size of their company internal R&D was $6.2 billion. That was 13.1% of their revenues that year. And incidentally, the software industry averages 13.3%. So it's a little hair less than the average amount spent on R&D by a software company. Now, Google made one big company acquisition in 2011. They bought Motorola Mobility. That's not really an innovation play. Motorola had all, I'm sorry, Google had already announced the Android phone and they desperately needed Motorola's uh, patent portfolio to protect and support their phones. That was a current market play. So I kind of exclude it from the innovation thing. Motorola bought 24 startup companies in the year 2011. 
these startup companies are in things like e-commerce uh, platforms and e-commerce promotion, video recognition, uh, security. Interesting thing is they were areas of business that were obviously critical to Google's overall strategy, but not really part of their current business. We estimate, based on the numbers that were reported, that Google probably spent, oh, 600 million or 700 million dollars total on those 24 companies. Now, we don't really have figures on how many technologies they licensed. One of the problems with doing this kind of analysis is that there's a lot of things that people don't say on the surface. Um, further out, maybe three to seven years in the future, Google invested about $100 million through Google Ventures, its corporate venture capital arm. And they have increased the amount of investment that Google Ventures does every year to $300 million in 2013. Now, if you're doing venture capital investing, you're only buying a minority stake in a startup company. You're not buying controlling interest. Although, yeah, venture capitalists can be pretty controlling. Anyway, you're buying a minority stake in something because you think it might be very important for you, but you're not committed enough to buy the whole thing. Later, if these uh, you know, startup companies that they did VC and if those companies' ideas really start to look like they need them, they may buy the rest of the stock in the company. Even further out, yes, Google supports a lot of good university research. Is there anybody from Google here? Okay, because I can't get a good number on how much university research. I looked around at what they're doing at Stanford. I looked at what they're doing that they tell you about at MIT and at some of the other places. My guess is that Google spent about $20 million in university, in supporting university research. So the distinctive thing about university research support is that the companies have very little control over what happens here, right? Academic freedom's a big deal around here. So what you see is you see most of the money spent here and the further out you are, they spend less money and have less control, but they really want to see a broader range of ideas. So this is kind of the way that open innovation works around here. Google is a good example now for years. Cisco Systems was so famous for open innovation that uh, people claimed that it did not have R&D. It had A&D, acquire and develop strategy. Um, that's kind of unfair because they were spending five billion dollars on their company internal R&D. Um, anyway, why does an established big company do this? I want to make very clear that this is very different from outsourcing. With outsourcing, the big company knows pretty much exactly what it wants and it pays somebody else to develop it, either because they're cheaper than doing it in-house or because they have some sort of special capabilities that you don't need to develop in-house. So that's outsourcing. Open innovation is much more opportunistic. You're trying to increase the number of new ideas that are getting into your innovation pipeline. You're letting others pay for incubating that idea until you reach some sort of an interesting optimization point. You're going to optimize risk to a minimum level and return to a maximum level and price to as the third axis on this so that at the right time you buy something from outside the company or you acquire it through licensing or you you know partner with it different kinds of open innovation involve different types of relationships the most important part of open innovation is that companies use it to access different types of ideas than you can easily incubate inside the big company. You want something different from outside than what your people are doing inside. Um, you know, if you show the kind of reduction in risk, you can see how the venture investors start out with a startup company that's creating a new market and developing a new technology. And as people actually see they may have a working prototype, 
that could perform at a certain you know, cost level, yeah, they become a much better candidate for acquisition. Uh, as people start to play with beta versions of this uh, new device or whatever, the market risk goes down. They become a much better candidate for acquisition. Um, but it's really hard to develop a disruptive idea inside the big company. And by that, I mean it's really hard to continue incubating something when people, other people in the management see it as possibly cutting into an existing business. When it's the right time, you can buy it, but it's really hard to incubate it inside. Um, usually a sales division will not allow something from R&D to persist if it's going to cut into their existing sales. Christensen noticed this in his um, theory of disruptive innovation. He noticed that um, really, um, how did he say it? Too much customer focus will prevent you from developing a new product. Uh, and the, the famous quote behind this goes back to the example of the automobile. Henry Ford said, if I, had asked what my if I had asked my customers what they wanted, they would have told me a faster horse. So it's really hard to come up with something disruptive inside the company. It's really only possible when you've got the personal attention of the CEO. That may explain a lot of what happened at Apple, right? Um, but big companies need to deliver disruptive ideas once in a while. Otherwise, their existing business lines are going to top out the top of the S curve happens. And while you're trying to sustain your existing business line, somebody's going to come along and do it cheaper. Or have a disruptive innovation from another angle that will disturb what you're doing. So as a big company manager, you must always consider that your, ex your experience has limits. Things will come along in the future that you may not expect. The secret of managing open innovation is to be able to take advantage of those opportunities at the right time. So the big companies are seeking disruptive ideas from the outside. Um, now, so much for the conceptual framework. Let's talk a little bit about how disruptive ideas play into the whole cycle of economic growth. Um, basically, disruptive ideas and open innovation become more important as an economy becomes more advanced. Now I'm going to show you a chart and we'll spend some time talking about it where following Michael Porter uh, there are three stages of economic development that are often distinguished. I don't like the terms for the stages but um, they start somewhere. So at the first stage is what um, Porter and also Global Entrepreneurship Monitor continues to call factor-driven economies. These may be developing economies, okay? Uh, the second stage is what he calls efficiency-driven economies, and at the third stage is what he calls innovation-driven economies. One reason I don't like these terms is because innovation occurs everywhere at all stages. But a particular kind of innovation becomes more important as the economy becomes more advanced. So what happens when an economy is industrializing? Thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people move to the cities. Uh, the government finally gets around to establishing basic laws. There's a basic infrastructure that kind of comes out. Uh, it's really a gold rush. And I think this is the situation we see in China right now. It's still a gold rush to supply the basic primary needs of the population. You may create new industries because there was no industry there before that. Um, at the second stage, though, typically what happens, you now have some sort of an industrial base. There's usually a labor shortage and a capital shortage. And 
what happens is that the skills of the labor force don't quite keep up with the speed of economic development. This means that the big companies, the existing companies, offer wonderful packages to people to hire the best people in the labor force. This is where uh, lifetime employment came from in Japan. The old days, HP got its best people. IBM got its best people because they would never leave Big Blue, right? Um, after this stage, while this stage is happening though, the real way that companies make a lot of money is by opening up new markets with their existing products. We'll see how this plays out a little bit more. The key competitive strength at this point is your ability to scale rapidly, and yes, your efficiency and your uh, operational quality. Um, however, if you can standardize an activity, it will flow to a lower cost economy. If you can standardize some process or some product, there will always be some place where it's cheaper that you can make the product. Even look inside the United States. How, much, uh, how many computer chips are still manufactured in Silicon Valley? Some specialty ones. But Intel moved all of its manufacturing out of the valley, right? It's in Arizona and Oregon and places like that where it's cheaper. So that's one thing. There is this pressure to maintain high wage levels that means that you're competing against places where the wage levels are a lot lower. Also, one of the things that people do as an economy develops is they invest heavily in education. The difficulty of getting rid of the car industry in Detroit is that you can make a very high hourly wage with a high school education. You have to be good at what you do. You really have to have the skills, but it doesn't require the kind of critical thinking that's the hallmark of a university education. This means that the children of the people who are line workers typically are going to college and they want a different future and their parents kind of want them to have a brighter future. They don't want them in the factory all day. Um, so as wealth spreads and as higher education spreads throughout the population, different kinds of competitive aspects or competitive opportunities appear. The real hallmark for um, business opportunity in an advanced economy is creative, fresh new ideas, out of the box thinking, seeing something before the people around you see it. Um, yeah, this is, uh, yeah, I think this will come out a little bit better if we, if we look at some more specific uh, examples. Uh, I did want to point out that, you know, in the, as economies develop, you run a greater likelihood that you will cause, be causing some sort of disruption as you develop a new idea. In a factor-driven economy, it's a blank slate. You're bringing in the first set of industry. Um, and then you expand your business by opening up new markets. That's relatively lower risk, right, than uh, the risk of developing a new technology and a new market. Um, and there is this general principle of why should you take on any more risk than you have to. Um, yeah, so you really need disruptive innovations to keep an economy going uh, forward. Look at some uh, GDP numbers, just as a kind of prelude to the next kind of discussion. So, world economy. U.S. GDP per person is almost $50,000. Third largest economy, China, is 9100 Now, this is a PPP calculation according to the CIA World Factbook. I was in Korea last week giving a kind of version of this talk to a big conference, and I was surprised to find out that uh, Korea, which in PPP, according to the CIA factbook, has a GDP of about 32,400, uh, the official figures in Korea are still $22,000. That's at the official exchange rate. 
So you really, uh, you know, do take these kind of as uh, under advisement. So China at 9,100, there's a huge amount of regional difference, right? In the East Coast cities, the GDP is already close to 13,000 or $14,000. In the interior, it's a lot less. India is averaging about 3,900, but there are some islands in India we'll talk about. Japan at 36,000, um, South Korea at 32,000, Taiwan at 38,000, um, and then you've got Hong Kong and Singapore even higher than the United States. So what's going on? Okay, China is a classic factor-driven economy, even though people don't use the term developing economy for China. The World Bank calls it a transitional economy. Uh, but there are huge business opportunities just to grow things for the domestic market. Um, most of the economic growth until recently was really through investment, not through consumption. But the percentage of the economy and consumption has been uh, growing drastically in the last few years. It's relatively easy to bring something into China that hasn't been there before, still, um, not to disrupt an existing industry. Fascinating point is the U.S. venture capital firms really got active going into China about 10 years ago. A lot of them brought their Silicon Valley attitudes of what was a good investment over to China, and within a year had changed their investment strategy. They weren't investing in difficult technology development problems. They were investing in factories that make milk cartons because milk consumption in China was growing by 60 or 70 percent a year. Why take the risk if you don't have to? So they had really moved into lower tech business ideas that come along with the evolution of an industry or consumer demands. Um, there are regional differences in China that really track the U.S. better than just about any other country in Asia. What is happening now is a lot of the advanced East Coast cities are now starting to compete against the Tier 2 cities in the inland because labor is a lot cheaper, land is a lot cheaper in the Tier 2 cities, or even the Tier 3 cities. Uh, but you do see disruptive innovations. E-commerce is really changing the way that retailing is done in China, and we have a presentation on that later in the series. India is fascinating because it's got little islands of global business in the middle of a still early stage developing agrarian economy. But these little islands account for a, a big part of Indian GDP but if you look at how much domestic sales Infosys and Wipro does, do, it's less than 2% of their total yearly output is to the domestic Indian market. So uh, in this sector, this IT services innovation sector, what you really have is companies that are competing globally for the world markets along against Oracle, against SAP, You've got heavy competition in world software alongside a lot of new business ideas to develop bottom of the pyramid businesses. Bottom of the pyramid businesses are often a classic factor driven opportunity. It may or may not involve disrupting some existing industry. So last spring, this spring, we had two Indian companies that we featured. Red Bus does online bus ticket sales. And Red Bus it disrupted existing channels of bus ticket sales, but everybody benefited because there was, it was better information to people and the retailers could also have better access to a broader range of sales. In Oz, the other company that we featured was delivering Google type search using cell phone SMS. Um, this one was probably not really disrupting anything because most of the people it was targeting did not have access to the internet otherwise. They were able to use this service in order to get Google type search using SMS. 
So that one, I think, was not really uh, disruptive, although it was a new market. By the way, Redbus got acquired by a Chinese company. So I'm curious if that means that Redbus's next step is to take the idea into the Chinese market. Um, we'll see. Moving up the line of companies, South Korea is really at the cusp of leaving the efficiency-driven economy stage and getting into the innovation-driven economy stage. Most of the successes of the Korean economy in the last 20 or 30 years are really Korean companies taking over world markets from other companies, like Japanese companies. So in DRAM, right, the Korean companies definitely took their market share away from Japanese companies. LCD TVs. Um, if you go back to the history of LCDs, they started out in the U.S., and then the Japanese took them from the U.S., and then Koreans take them from the Japanese. Automobiles is where it's at now. How many advertisements have you seen for Hyundai and Kia lately? The market growth is dramatic just in the last year. Whose market share are they taking? Okay, I would have to say it's probably Toyota and Nissan. Um, cell phones. So U.S. Motorola, and you had, remember Nokia? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the Japanese cell phone makers never really did get outside the Japanese markets very well. But all of this is going to Samsung and LG. When you are in Beijing, you will see advertisements for Samsung phones heavily. Um, so. You know, basically, this did disrupt an existing industry, but they did it with an existing technology. It's a classic efficiency play. At the beginning, the Korean products were as good, but their cost performance was better. As the companies made money, to their credit, their performance is even better. So this is great for a stage two economy. Um, but the Korean government is already aware that there is a limit to this. The new Korean government that started this past year, their buzzword is the creative economy. And they are trying very hard to promote entrepreneurship. They are very hard to promote a particular kind of innovation which comes from internal sources, not from copying somebody else. Um, this is also an attempt to mitigate the danger of a very highly concentrated economy. The big Chebol companies have a lot of the available capital in the Korean economy. And I think that the government would like to see this spread out as being a more healthy way for the economy to continue to grow. So South Korea is still in the stage two, still efficiency driven, but it's getting closer and closer. I'm on the uh, advisory board for a, a startup accelerator in Seoul, and I was just there last week. And there are really interesting, great ideas coming out. But the problem for Korean companies right now is that the open innovation isn't there. The big companies don't buy their products. If they acquire the company, they usually do so to keep it out of the market, not to really take advantage of it. Um, so if you move on to Japan, I think Japan is finding its way as an innovation-driven economy. There are some disruptive new ideas. Uniqlo really changed the whole department store scene in Japan. The big department stores are still there, but they have to do business in a different way thanks to the discount uh, business model that Uniqlo brought in. But throughout the history of Japan, the really giant, famous new companies that appear, whether it's DNA and GRI, or whether it's SoftBank years before that, or way back before that, Panasonic, Honda Motors, are all companies that somehow were first movers in creating new industries, giant new markets. More recent examples, I'm a big fan of the, the uh, Suica card, which is, uh, Probably one of the first cards that you can use uh, in the to 
pay for your train fares in Japan. It's a brilliant system. And Suica is now accepted by taxi cabs. It's accepted on buses. It's also accepted in a lot of convenience stores. Is this really disrupting an existing industry? Kind of hard to see how it would be disrupting an existing industry. Micropayments didn't really happen before that. Um, DNA and Gree, the mobile game publishing, that was new. It didn't really take market share away from anybody else in order to become big. SoftBank, um, they were really the first people who understood how to make money with shrink-wrapped software in Japan. <coughs> Up until that time, there was no market for shrink-wrapped software. Most companies used business systems with custom-made software that was part of a specific hardware product. There was no interoperability at all. So uh, SoftBank, you know, definitely created something new. The older, bigger firms are having trouble with open innovation. This is not unique to Japan at all, but it's really hard to break a good customer relationship. You know, and as Christensen said, if um, you're too focused on your customer, you may miss the opportunity. Um, the incentive for open innovation to R&D personnel are also not quite well developed. Taiwan, I think, is in slightly earlier stages of an innovation-driven economy. Uh, there's been this outflow of a lot of manufacturing away from Taiwan into the mainland. A lot of the money behind it is Taiwanese money. Uh, companies are not really competing on growth in the domestic Taiwan market. Um, there's a long history of science parks. Shinshu Science Park is at least 30 years old. Um, there's still a strong base of contract and component manufacturing, but it's fascinating how you see this shift inside the business of TSMC from cost-based competition to manufacturing excellent-based competition to customer service-based competition. And Professor Hao Li and, and Sun Jin Huang here at Stanford's JSB wrote this up in a fascinating case study. Um, but you do still see stage two kinds of things. Just last week, uh, Honhai Precision Industry announced that they're going to form a JV to sell cell phones in Indonesia. Okay, great expansion. Um, now, Hong Kong and Singapore, which actually have higher GDP per person than the U.S. does, are really investment-driven economies. They're urban economies. And there are some characteristics of being innovation-driven. You do have strong R&D institutions. You've got you know, good universities and research centers. Um, the entrepreneurial activities there do focus more on entrepreneurship of opportunity than on entrepreneurship of necessity. People decide to be an entrepreneur because they think that's the best way for them to have an impact, not because they can't get a job in an existing company. Um, economic growth is really a function of a lot of external investments in other Asian markets. But some innovation services are very strong. Uh, Hong Kong and Singapore both try to sell themselves as places to put your IP before you go into China. Um, still the case that top students are aiming for jobs in financial industries and government more than they're aiming for entrepreneurial careers. And yet the governments are working to promote innovation and entrepreneurship. The U.S. has really grown over the last uh, 30 years in regard to entrepreneurial innovation, which really means open innovation, right? Because the big companies buy the output. In uh, 1981, large firms accounted for 70%, 71% of all corporate spending on R&D in the U.S. That number had dropped to 38% by the year 2005. Now, I don't want to say that big companies have stopped spending on R&D. In absolute dollar numbers, the uh, growth in R&D spending among companies, big companies in the U.S., was almost four times during this time period. The 
point is that small firms and medium-sized firms grew even more, grew even faster, uh, so that they now take up you know, almost a quarter of all of the R&D spending is on these firms. Sure enough, smaller firms are accounting for you know, a much higher percentage of American patents than they used to. What does this really show? It shows people are desperate and are spending a lot of money on what they think will be disruptive innovation. It's the venture investors who are funding this. So the big companies want to buy it when they can buy it instead of incubating it in-house. In comparison, open innovation still lags in Asia. I could only get numbers from Japan and South Korea, but um, the percentage of patents filed in the U.S. filed by small entities, individuals and small firms, was 36% in the U.S. Now, that's probably skewed on the high side because if you're in the U.S., it makes sense to file in the U.S. If you're in a foreign country, you only file in the U.S. if you think that your patent is worth paying the extra money to file in the U.S. for. So if you look at the rest of the OECD, excluding the U.S., 26% of the patents filed in the U.S. were by small entities. But Japan, only 4.4% of the patents filed were by small entities. Of the patents filed in the U.S. were filed by small entities. South Korea, 144 um, So some non-U.S. countries have a much higher percentage. I was fascinated to find out that 52.4% of U.S. patents that came from Israel were filed by small entities. So uh, certainly Israel is, is focusing on this entrepreneurial innovation. Um, where do we go from here? I want to examine some potentially disruptive innovations that we see coming from Asia economies and really explore whether these new value chains are indi indicating an increase in open innovation or not. So we'll let industry speak for itself. Next week, we've got a panel discussion of new platforms for data-driven analysis. And we've got the CEO of Crowd Analytics, which is fascinating. They take analytic problems from companies and crowdsource them to a community of data scientists. Great play, but certainly a play for the world market. And the other company is Algorithms.io, which has won an award here in um, Silicon Valley, they have a kind of modularized platform for easy to develop custom analytics. Um, in a couple of weeks, we'll look at nanoelectronics, have a presentation by a new industry consortium coming from Japan. On the 24th of this month, we've got a presentation that I think will be on data-driven marketing. It's definitely coming from SK Planet, which is um, kind of a big you know, online advertising company in Korea. We've got a presentation on hydrogen energy storage. We've got a presentation on water resource management. And we've got a presentation on e-commerce and retailing. So I think it'll be a fun quarter. We'll see what industry says for itself. And uh, I hope that today was useful in regard to seeing the whole kind of conceptual framework. I'd be happy to take questions for a few minutes. Thank you. Ed. Richard, uh, I'm curious. Um, there's a theory in Silicon Valley that there's a special or secret sauce here. It's a very secret difficult. sauce? Yeah, it's very difficult to export it. But you're talking about trends in moving from you know group two to group three economies. Um, what is the time period that you think it's going to take for some of the advanced Asian economies, the so-called Asian tigers, term from the 90s, to sort of, say, catch up to Silicon Valley? And do you think that innovation is, is still going to continue here? I think that uh, it doesn't happen at a regular continuous pace. I think you see jumps. Uh, I think that a few success stories in some of the big Asia economies will really change the, the mood there rather quickly. I think that there's always a danger. Innovation is risky. It's a riskier basis for corporate growth, and you have to use that basis for corporate growth in an advanced economy. Uh, you don't have to use it so much if you're cheaper than other people and you can do good manufacturing. Um, 
But I don't think that the Silicon Valley system will break. The reason I say that is because we have so many different areas of technology here. Just the pure scale of Silicon Valley is bigger than anywhere else I've seen. I do think that if you look over the next 50 to 100 years, you'll see a kind of clustering into these urban centers of innovation like Silicon Valley. We've already seen a number of them grow up in the rest of the US. You know, and, and okay, Boston, Massachusetts area is as old as Silicon Valley is. But uh, you'll see this developing where the wage levels will be higher, the prices will be higher. The kind of exciting thing about China is that the whole level is going up, but the East Coast is really starting to look like Silicon Valley in some ways. So in some ways, a national economy, comparison of national economies, is the wrong yardstick to use. Uh, yeah, but thanks. Good question. Go ahead. Yeah. Some of the market research firms are predicting that because of shale gas and the, and, and the really lowering cost of energy, the energy intensive products in the factoring economies, like liquid crystal displays, are going to come back to this country. <laughs> That could happen. Certainly, shale gas has had a, a huge impact on a lot of industries already. And I think that um, this is one of those kinds of things. We'll never get rid of manufacturing in the US, but what makes US co manufacturing competitive? It's going to be its flexibility. It's going to be its modularization. It's going to be being able to be more cost effective at small batch manufacturing. Right, The kind of things that fit in with these sort of innovation skills. Uh, it's very dangerous for an economy to lose the knowledge that's associated with the basic level stuff. And one of the things that I've thought about for a long time is that you have to keep manufacturing in, a, in an economy to keep the knowledge base for everything else. I saw this in the semiconductor industry big time, right? All the firms were becoming fabulous. And then all of a sudden, what's the new sort of sources of, of uh, competitiveness? The ability to deal with new advanced materials that don't fit old standard CMOS. So uh, I do think manufacturing will stay. Tom? Uh, so I'm going to go back to that first question, kind of just sit around. But first yeah. of all, would, can you go back to that slide that showed open innovation on the bottom and on the top was the other set of, uh, I guess, like spinning out things? Just wanted to get that. This one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, one of the questions, the question I have is, with this open innovation, to what extent is, is that this this intangible human element that Silicon Valley has? You have the, the law firms here. You have the PR firms. You have all this stuff, and there's this funny soup, and somehow things really happen out of it. And to what extent can you build a structure, an infrastructure? Can somebody say, well, this is what we need to do to have this if we just have all these things? You can develop a legal system, but you've got to have the case law to support it. And so I do think that the knowledge that has developed here from doing this over the years puts us pretty far ahead. Uh, there's nothing secret that can't be you know, replicated somewhere else. Although every place has got to match its own culture. You know, in Confucian cultures, business is more relationship based. Here it's very transactional. And I think that's one reason open innovation developed as easily as it did in the US. What's the idea of an entrepreneur starting a company here? I'll grow it for seven or 10 years and make a bunch of money. I'll give the money to my children, or I'll use the money to you know, invest in the next company. Uh, in Asia, most entrepreneurs think that the companies are like their children, and selling your child to somebody else is not very nice, right? So <laughs> it, that does make a disadvantage in this whole open innovation. But yet, there may be advantages to having tighter relationships that you can rely on more. We really haven't seen just how it will play out in different economies. It'll be really interesting. I think that um, the scale of Silicon Valley and the experience of Silicon Valley are by far 
our biggest competitive advantages. But the good thing about the valley is you keep moving on to the next new thing, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm confident for us as we go forward. Ilif? Yeah, I, I met with a young entrepreneur yesterday who is te has a company teaching entrepreneurship. And he told me that South Korea is uh, apparently the government is planning to spend megabucks on, on that. And um, he, he, he didn't give me any details on it. I was wondering if you have heard anything about that. What kind of policies uh, is South Korea thinking of uh, using here? And is that likely to be successful? Uh, there, are, there's a number of direct kind of fiscal <coughs> policies about investing, uh, creating investment funds, and so forth. There's a lot to encourage groups to develop uh, educational approaches. Um, all of that's good, you know. And and as someone who studies entrepreneurship, I'd love to have a little bit of it too. Uh, but the um, danger for this is that if you don't also grow the ability of the company to be successful in the market, you can promote entrepreneurship until you're blue, and you'll get a lot of frustrated young people. You know, the, uh, it's really, you have to have access to the market. And the problem is not in the creation stage, it's not in the early incubation stage, the problem is in the market stage. Innovators and entrepreneurs need early adopters. Where are the early adopters are in the large companies, typically. And if you don't have those, if it's a closed innovation environment, you've got a problem. That's true. Uh, if you can tip the scale a little bit, people make economically rational choices. And so if you tip the scale a little bit so that if you leave the big company and you try your own company, if that's not a one-way street out of the mainstream, then you'll get better people trying to build companies. Um, but yeah, you're right. You need early adopters. Those early adopters are in every economy. There are wonderful entrepreneurial young people throughout all of Asia. Um, in Korea and in Japan, most of the young people are worried about, is it OK to be this way? <laughs> and what happens is the classic Jeff Moore break between the early adopters and the mass market. Somehow you've got to have some success stories that will virally spread entrepreneurship to the right people in the economy. There's one other thing that entrepreneurship really needs. When people talk about Silicon Valley, they never talk about the people who go to work for Square now, when Square's got a couple of hundred people, right? It's only two or three years old. The companies that have 30 to 1,000 people in Silicon Valley are well supplied by good people in the Silicon Valley labor force. But in a more traditional economy, they don't have the reputation and have a hard, harder time getting people to work for them. It's people who are willing to invest their own career in a high growth company, as well as the people who start the high growth companies that are really important. Great comment, thanks. I think we've got some, oh, please, go ahead. Uh, the comments regarding uh, Singapore and Hong Kong are very relevant. I met a venture capitalist who is American, originally from Marin County, who is now based in Singapore. And when I poked a little bit to find out why he moved to Singapore, he told me that, uh, and I don't remember the exact figure, but whatever investment he makes for a startup, the Singaporean government matches them, I believe, either five to one or six to one. So he puts in fifty thousand, and they match him with another two fifty or three hundred. See, this is one of those things that tips the scale, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and, and not only that, but earlier this week, I was invited to a meeting where three delegate, delegates from the Hong Kong government came in trying to lure startups into Hong Kong. Sure. As a, as a and. And there's a lot of good stuff going on there. It's a, the, both of those are really exciting places. They're fascinating. They don't have the reputation of the valley yet, right? Uh, but things will change. Thanks, everybody. We've got some refreshments outside. I hope you'll stay around and talk to each other. And I'd be happy to talk to you uh, informally and so forth. Anybody who's a student and has questions, let me know. Happy to talk. Uh, and look forward to seeing you again next week. Thanks.
in 2025 is predicted to be $100 trillion. Right now it's about 50 or 60. So this is, uh, you know, very interesting kind of uh, things to stay involved with. Now, startup companies are a great source of disruptive innovations. All companies have to innovate. If you don't innovate, somebody else eats your lunch pretty quickly. Um, even, you know, things like car companies or retail industries are always coming up with new kinds of sale promotions, new models, slight new, you know, variations on how the store looks. All, all businesses have to innovate. There are two big risks in innovation. The first risk is that you might not be able to deliver what you're trying to develop. That has been called technology risk. That was the term that Christensen used. There's another risk, and that is that even if you develop it, nobody's going to want to buy it. That's the market risk. If you are a big company, you can spend an awful lot of money developing a major new technology for an existing market. And companies do. So Honda Motor, this year is delivering Honda Jet, a small business jet for about six people that has all kinds of new performance characteristics and looks pretty neat. But the business jet market is relatively well known. They were able to predict how many airports they could get this thing into. They uh, were able to justify putting dozens of years of work and hundreds of people onto a project like this. Similarly, if you've got a relatively well-known existing technology, you can spend an awful lot of marketing money developing a new market for it. So what did Apple really do with the iPhone? It's a combina new combination of existing technologies. In fact, even the smartphone already existed before Apple started to develop the iPhone. But they put their brand behind it, they put their resources behind it, and did pretty well with it. If, however, your existing products, and that is now disrupting or displacing some earlier product and market, Often, this involves new firms taking over an industry or new kinds of industry structures like new supply chains. So, interesting point. Were automobiles a disruptive innovation? And this goes back to work by Christensen. The actual invention of the automobile was not particularly disruptive it didn't really replace the horse and carriage at first. The car started in what, the 1880s something? Until the Model T Ford was invented in 1920 something or other, um, there really wasn't much disruption of existing transportation industries. But because the Model T was lower price and mass produced, that's when people basically started traveling around in a different way. What did the Model, disrupt, the Model T disrupt? Horse-drawn carriages, okay. Also, city street, you know, street cars used to be all over the place. They dropped like a rock after the introduction of the telephone. Rail transportation in general. Some people argue that the reason rail transportation in the U.S. has gone down is because of the interstate highway system which is the disruptive innovation, the highways or the cars. Um, it also disrupted most of the early automobile companies. There were dozens of them that failed because Ford took over the market. And so really, yes, it was disruptive in a number of different ways. A um, couple of other more recent disruptive innovations. First of all, online advertising. I think this is fascinating because online advertising is taking the business away from traditional newspaper ads, magazine ads, TV commercials. There's a clear sucking away of that business. The newspapers are in, are in real trouble, right? 
But the other thing is this online advertising is at the center of a whole new supply chain. Now, the price of an advertisement on the internet can be optimized, cha meaning changed, right? Uh, once every one. So I'd like to talk about this conceptual framework. Disruptive ideas, startup companies, and open innovation. Sounds like a great collection of things. So a disruptive idea, which is usually called a disruptive innovation. I avoid the term innovation here because innovation is used in two different senses. It's used for the process by which you develop a new product and bring it to market. It's also used for the new thing that you bring to market itself. So in this sense, the new thing is, is somehow disruptive. It creates a new market or a new value network, usually by selling something to a new group of people. But it also eventually disrupts an existing market or value network. Um, it may displace an existing product. It may displace an existing industry. Uh, it can cause a major change in a supply chain. Um, this is, there's a lot of literature on this, but it really goes back to the work of Professor Clayton Christensen at Harvard. So he talked about uh, disruptive innovations. So good disruptive innovation going on right now. Smartphone cameras, right? Interesting thing about smartphone cameras is that although there were all kinds of experiments by Ericsson and in the United States and elsewhere in the 1990s, the first time a mobile carrier offered a phone with a camera in it was J-Phone in the year 2000. That doesn't seem like that long ago. J-Phone is was a Japanese uh, mobile carrier, and they're now, they were bought by Vodafone, the English company, and then they were bought by uh, uh, SoftBank. So they started all of this. And the early phones were pretty low quality compared to the compact cameras, even the point and shoot cameras that you could get on the market. Um, but they had connectivity, they were connected to your telephone, right? And they were really convenient. There was a, there's an old story about what is the best camera? 100 milliseconds. Real-time bidding is a hot new feature of the advertising industry. One of the reasons that this works is you've got people on the demand side who will aggregate all of the requests for advertisements by different companies that want to have their ads up on the internet, and the demand side platforms will guarantee not only that you get to a certain size audience, they will guarantee who you get through to. It's much more personalized than ever before. They want you to get to the influencer who will really encourage other people to buy your product. Um, on the supply side, there are other aggregator companies that basically aggregate all of the publishing space that's available. This is kind of like the old uh, advertising agency uh, business, but they're doing it online. And they will then maximize the kind of price that those companies can get uh, through this real-time bidding process. So you have a very new supply chain built up around this thing. Online retailing is really changing the, um, the regular old retail businesses, right? Not only is it cutting into sales of the brick and mortar stores, but it's changing the way that all retailers do business. How many regular old stores like Safeway are sending you emails, right? Emails or have loyalty coupons of some sort that you can download on your cell phone or whatever. This is, we're in the middle of a really huge transformation of a number of industries. This past year, in May 2013, McKinsey Global Institute 
set out a 150-page book of the 12 disruptive innovations that are going to change the way the world works. And these 12 disruptive innovations are things like 3D printing, genomic technologies, so on and so forth. But they predict that these 12 disruptive innovation areas will be the source of $33 trillion of new value by the year 2025. The total world GDP is the one that you have with you. So they were convenient. As the smartphone appeared with a standard operating system and also downloadable applications, they got a lot more useful. Can't smart, uh, cell phone cameras got to be a lot more useful, uh, especially for things like photo sharing. Another economic point is that the cost of the camera is bundled into the cost of the phone. You really don't have a choice of different cameras with an Apple iPhone, right? You get what they put in it. Um, there have been major improvements in the camera functionality itself since those early years, but they were popular from the very beginning. Cell phone cameras were popular from the time they were introduced. But now you can get a cell phone camera with a 41 megapixel image sensor, which is just sort of astounding to me. Um, but the disruptive nature of this innovation is not just how good the technology has gotten. The disruption is really against point and shoot cameras. When I uh, prepared for this, you should see the articles that came out since about last year of how Smart, smartphone cameras are the death knell for, sounding the death knell for point and shoot cameras or compact cameras. Their sales fell by 30% in 2011 and National Geographic and the Consumer uh, Electronics Association pointed out that 37% of all of the images taken in the United States were with camera phones in 2011, and that's expected to rise to 50% by 2015. That's a pretty big disruption of the existing camera industry. Now, it's true that the big, high-end uh, SLR digital cameras are still growing well. They grew about, 40, that market grew about 30% last year. But, to quote The Guardian, Canon and Nikon should pay heed or risk sequestering themselves in the ultra high-end camera ghetto. So this is a classic example of a disruptive innovation. You've got a creation of a new technology for a new market or a customer base. Then you've got performance improvements in the new device, which often started out at a lower level than existing.